Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help this video be pushed into the algorithm, but it also helps the channel and reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled, Let's Not Meet. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. I'm going to tell you a story that happened when I was 17. This story still freaks me out so much, and I don't even know what happened that day. I would like to have your opinion on it. It was in November, and my friend Jacob was going to have his birthday for these 17 years. Me being a good friend, I proposed to him to sleep at my house, and then go for a walk the next day with friends into the forest. He accepts. Everything goes well. He sleeps at my place, and the next day, we leave with friends for about two hours on the road. For the forest, it is a bit far, but at the time, I lived in the city center. After the road, I realized that I had forgotten my keys to my house, and therefore, the door to my house was not locked. But hey, I tell myself that we are in town, and that few people frequent the suburbs to fly. The day is going well, and it's time to go home. I was stressed about knowing if my house had been robbed. Then, in the end, I said to myself that there was only a little chance. My friend Jacob wanted to spend more time with me before I left for my studies, and so did he. So I accepted that he still sleeps with me. We walk in, and I see that my house is intact, but it was nice and wide open. So I walked around the house and noticed something. The cellar door, which I never open, was open, and there was white paper on the floor. I quickly realized that we had to call the police and check if there was anyone there so to reassure us. Me and Jacob decided to shout that if a stranger didn't come out, the police would take care of it. I was paralyzed with fear and I feared that the stranger was coming. Bad news. The stranger who was in the cellar cried. You are not at home. Get out of where I lock you up. Jacob got scared and asked me to come and see if there was the police. Luckily, she was there and took him away in a car. The police found kitchen knives, an axe, iron chains, and a board. There was also a white sheet on which was written, behind you. I didn't understand from the beginning. The police told me later that the individual ran away from an asylum today. I am 25, and now I always check if I have the key on me or not. The story starts with me getting home from high school on the bus. I made it home and saw that my mom wasn't there. And since my dad was at work and my bro didn't get out of school until later, I was the only person there. I put my backpack down and go to untie my shoes. And some dude walks out from a hallway. I go into Aukman's razor mode and assume that this is some sort of handyman or repair guy since he had been in recently and had been getting a lot of repair work done to fix the half-assed DIY electrical, plumbing, and paint jobs left behind by the previous owners. Additionally, 
He is wearing some sort of tool belt and fits the general repairman look. My mom's usually around when we have people working on the house, so I assume that my mom must have left not long ago and would be back soon. I nonchalantly tell the guy that my mom should be back soon, and he mumbles something like, Hmm, thanks, and leaves out of the front door to what I assume is a repair truck. It's at this point that I text my mom asking when she'll be back, and who's the dude in the house. She asks if I'm joking, and it's only at this point when I come to and realize that I was sitting on the couch chatting with the dude, burglaring our home. At this point, the guy was long gone, and luckily, my mom was only a couple minutes away at a store just down the road. She gets back and we call the police, and they take a look around, but nothing actually went missing, and nothing ever really came out of it. I'm honestly glad it went down the way it did since I only knew what happened once it was already over. This guy had put himself between me and the front door, and I'm not really sure what freaked out or flight or fight me would have done. I also can't imagine what the guy was thinking when I basically just let him walk out. So, to the burglar pretending to be a repairman, we hope we never ever see you again. So, I moved into a duplex with my ex about three years ago in what we thought was a safer part of the city. One of our neighbors, Amber, works in the duplex rental office and her husband, Ed, was at the time fresh out of prison. Later would see all of the swastika tattoos and had been doing and continues to do landscape work for the rentals like mowing the lawns cutting down the trees, etc. Other than that, he is home mostly doing odds and ends, things like tinkering with his mower or truck or something. They both are super nice people, very kind and loving towards others, and always offers to help out. We have smoked weed together a few times. Ed smokes more than Amber. And have talked about all kinds of things so I thought I could trust them and felt very safe being their neighbor. I once mentioned how sometimes when I'm home alone, I hear steps in the attic over my room and what sounds like a chair being dragged. How sometimes the noise follows me around the house and always freaks me out to the point of calling someone just to feel a little safer until the noises died down. Ed said, <laughs> What? You think we're spying on you? In a laughing way, but it creeped me out a little. So then, I break up with my boyfriend and he moves out. This is recent, so it's a few months ago. Ed started texting me, asking if I wanted to smoke while Amber was still at work. I declined every time, finding different excuses because I still felt uncomfortable, especially around him. Then, he asked if I wanted to have sex with him because he thinks Amber is cheating on him. I definitely shut that down, and it was awkward as fuck. I didn't tell Amber because I didn't want to get kicked out or have some horrible, awkward tension. And I, for one, hate confrontations, so I kept quiet. That's when I start to hear things in the attic above my room more often. It freaked me out even more when I woke up to a loud bang outside of my front door at about 3 or 4 in the morning. When I went to examine it, there was a small lockpick outside my door on the ground, but no one was around. I kept the lockpick, and the next day, I texted the picture of it to Amber to let her know I thought someone was creeping around, and she said, Oh, that's Ed's. That's his ice pick, not a lock pick, sweetie. No, no one can pick your deadbolt with that. But I know the difference in a 
four inch skinny ass lock pick and an ice pick. I'm so scared to be alone here, especially at night. Our attics connect and it's not outlandish to think he could be up there spying on me. I even found a freshly drilled hole in the ceiling of my room. I just put wadded paper in it and try not to think of it. I honestly hope nothing comes of it and I'm just being paranoid. Quick edit. For everyone saying to me to call the police, I really have no evidence. I have the lockpick still and pictures of my front door being messed with, but when I've gone into the attic, it's been completely empty. I've never gone in alone because its opening is in my garage and there is no ladder so it requires two people. But as of now, it is a gaping hole above my washer and dryer and very hard to go into without good upper body strength. I'd called my ex to come home when the dragging would start, and by the time he got there, it'd be cleared out. So I'm hesitant to report anything with no evidence. This is 100% true. I'm staying with my boyfriend until I move out in a few weeks, despite my neighbors being upset I'm leaving. To address another thing, I didn't see any swastika tattoos until months after I had been hanging out on their back porch to smoke with them. He had his shirt off for the first time, and there were at least three on his body. Confused me because Amber and Ed are super Wiccan. She has Wicca tattoos all over her and stuff, and so I believe maybe his tattoos were for protection in prison? Either way, after that, I stopped hanging out with them and would only speak to them if we were both outside at the same time. I didn't know if I wanted to write this down or not, but while listening to things on YouTube, I suddenly remembered this. So, I lived alone in a bad neighborhood just outside of the city. At this point, I had been living there for maybe three years with no incident. Well, I mean, there were several shootings on my street, but no one shot at me, so no incident, I guess. I'm the kind of person who can't sit still for very long, so I find myself standing or pacing a lot. On this particular night, maybe at about 2 a.m., I was pacing while reading a textbook to prepare for an upcoming test at my university. I stopped pacing for a little bit and just stood near my front door to read. That's when I heard my doorknob turn. For some reason, though I nearly shit myself, I was able to calm down and look at my deadbolt to double check that it was in fact locked. And it was. Phew. I looked through the peephole to see who was trying to come in, but no one was standing there. Obviously, this was confusing. I neither am superstitious nor a believer in the supernatural, but I'm also stupid. So my first thought was, is a ghost trying to break into my house? Thankfully, that thought gave way to a more logical thought of, Maybe they're going around back. So I quickly moved to the back door to make sure it too was locked. And it was. But then my front doorknob turned again. I tiptoe ran to the front door. At this point, my heart is pounding. My dog, a big old protective teddy bear, is looking at me with major concern in his eyes. I look through the front peephole again, but there's still no one there. That's when I heard a small knock on my door. Yes, I am looking through the peephole. Then a small child voice said, Let me in. Silence. Let me in. I'm still looking through the peephole while covering my mouth with my hand to make my breathing quieter. Through the peephole, I see a small three-year-old-ish girl walk to the edge of my porch and look into my bushes. 
She nods, then says, Okay. In what I think was supposed to be a whisper. She walks closer to the door again, and I lose sight of her in the peephole. She tries the handle again, then knocks and says, Please, let me in. My uncle is a cop, so I had heard about people using children as a way to get people to open their door before blitz attacking. So I'm pretty sure that's what's happening at this point. I wasn't sure how to handle the situation, so I just said, not even into a phone, Hi, I think someone is trying to break into my apartment. Yeah, my address? 123 Fake Street Avenue. Yeah, I'll stay on the line. I then saw a shadow emerge from the bushes. Thankfully, they scooped the kid and ran off. There were two people and the kid. People who tried to break into my apartment to rob and kill me. I really hope I never meet you again. It happened in my bedroom at the age of 10. I always had trouble sleeping and spent most nights tossing and turning. I was a horror film fanatic as a child, and being scared was something I didn't have much experience with. I was not afraid of the dark, nor was I easily swayed by strange sounds or odd encounters. I did, however, know when to haul ass out of a situation or to find a trusted adult. I always slept with my closet doors open, which will come to be of some significance later in the story. I should also mention that my family home was in a heavily wooded area, in what some may refer to as the middle of nowhere. One night at around 1 a.m., I awoke to a sound coming from underneath my bed. It sounded like one of my cats was scratching themselves with one of their feet or doing something to cause a thumping beneath me. I had heard this same sound many times before, and its source has always been one of my fuzzy friends. So this time I didn't look. I closed my eyes and tried to resume my slumber. I turned over onto my left side which left me facing the wall against which my bed was pressed up against. I heard the sound again, and thinking that my kitty was directly beneath me, I said, Good night. I was able to fall asleep once again. The next time I woke, it was to a surreal and shocking scene. The sheet and comforter of my bed were no longer covering me. I saw a man standing over my bed, poking me, fucking poking me with his finger. And the way in which he was doing it was so truly horrifying. It was not the way that a child would poke a friend in jest. It was as if he was touching another human being for the first time. Exploring the sensation of the tip of his index finger jabbing my flesh. What I saw was so unbelievable, so impossibly strange, that I believed I was dreaming. I tried desperately to wake up from my nightmare to no avail. The poking continued. He poked at my chest, my belly, my legs, and arms. Paralyzed and scared shitless, I yelled, wake up, and with this, the man threw himself to the floor and closed his eyes, as he was trying to lead me to believe that he was asleep or dead. I have no fucking idea. It was at this time I realized I could not have been dreaming. I somehow found the ability to move, and I jumped from the top of my bed over the man lying next to me and ran towards my parents' room. When I got to their bedroom door, something came over me. I told myself that this was all impossible, that there was no way that a person could have entered our home without breaking in, 
as we had always kept every door and window locked at night. I had seen many strange things in my home whilst either falling asleep or waking up. By the third or fourth time, after speaking to my mom or dad about it, I knew that it was in my mind, and my mind was playing tricks on me. Plush toys do not have the ability to turn and whisper into each other's ears. Do not ask why, dear listener, as I have no explanation to offer you. But I turned away from my parents' bedroom door and decided to hastily check the house for a break-in. What I found was that nothing was out of the ordinary. No broken windows or locks, no busted doors, nothing. I assured myself that I had to have been dreaming or hallucinating and blamed my obsession with horror for this. I made my way down the long, dark, and narrow hallway to my bedroom. I peeked inside and saw no one. I turned on the light, got down on the floor just outside the doorway, and looked under the bed. Nothing. I proceeded to check both of my windows for signs of a break-in, which were not present. Both windows were closed and locked. I knew it. I was totally seeing things. I crawled back into bed and decided to watch some TV in order to calm myself down and distract my thoughts of the scary as hell dream or hallucination I had just had. I turned on the TV, flipped to a channel with a seemingly boring program. This always helped me become sleepy and put the remote control on the bedside table. I was lying on my right side, facing away from the wall that I mentioned previously. As I laid there, my eyes began to adjust to the dark room with the faint light of the TV screen. Just beyond the TV, I saw something that made my heart sink into the pit of my stomach. Inside my closet, with one of the doors now slightly closed, I saw the man standing perfectly still, facing the wall, hiding, waiting for me to fall asleep, I imagine. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I sat and stared at the man in my closet for what seemed like minutes, but was likely only a few seconds. I quietly got out of bed, hoping that the man wouldn't notice and that my dad could catch him hiding in the closet. I once again made my way to my parents' bedroom door, still remaining as quiet as I possibly could, and went inside. I shook my dad and mom at the same time, and when they woke, I said, Shh, don't make a sound. There's someone in my closet. My parents both jumped up and said, What? I repeated myself and asked them to please call 911. My mom immediately picked up the phone. Neither of my parents doubted my claim, as I had always been honest and forthright. They both knew there was no way that I was making this up, or that I was mistaken. I'm sure that that look I must have had on my face made it clear that this was really happening. My dad told my mom and I that he was going to look and urged us to stay in their bedroom and lock the door. So we did. At this point, I was beyond scared. I didn't know what the man was capable of, whether he had a weapon or whether my dad was safe. I just stood in the room with my mom and cried. After what felt like hours, my dad knocked on the door and told me it was him, and that it was okay to open the door. My mom unlocked the door and let my dad inside. I said something to the effect of, Did you get him? And my dad looked at me with the most unsettling and confused look imaginable. He said, There's no one there. I assured him that there was indeed a man in my room and that he had been poking me. 
My dad said that he had just checked every inch of the house and found no one. He also checked the doors and windows, just as I had done. Then it hit me. He must have a key. As soon as I said this, my parents looked at each other in absolute terror. Our nearest neighbor, a trusted and beloved friend, whom we consider family, was in possession of a key to our house. As she had regularly babysat me since I was a toddler, she was the only person outside of my immediate family with a key to our home. Soon after this revelation, the police arrived, took statements, checked around our property, and left. None of us got any sleep that night. The next day, my dad went to my neighbor's house and asked if she knew where her key to our house was. She said yes, and when she went to show him, she saw that it was missing. Her home had no signs of a break-in, and she had always kept her doors and windows locked. My parents had all of the locks on our doors changed and opted to never again give a key to anyone, except in the wake of an emergency. I never discovered the identity of the man that lurked in my bedroom that night. The event left me traumatized, and it took a very long time for me to accept what had happened and move on. My sleeping trouble turned into full-on insomnia, and for about a decade I was unable to sleep without a light on. It has been 20 years since that night, and apart from my parents, I have never told a soul about it until now. I have actually found writing this down to be very cathartic. And I am glad that I stumbled a crowd that would listen to my story. My heart goes out to anyone who has suffered a trauma in their lives, and I hope that you are able to find peace within yourselves. So, this started about two or three years back. I had just experienced a terrible breakup, and I started receiving those disturbing phone calls. It started simple. The first call I answered, and the person on the other end said how much they had missed me. Now, I have a very small circle of friends, and I'm not on Facebook or any social media site where I update my photos or daily activities like everyone else. This is important, and I know that the ex I just split up with had nothing to do with the following. Apologies, it's not short. The first call, like I said, was simple. They said they missed me. I asked who it was, and they said it's me. Don't you remember? So I hung up, and they immediately called back, crying, upset that I was being mean. The caller was clearly an adult male, but they were talking as though they were very childlike. Come to think of it, a six-year-old child. I hung up again, and they didn't call back. Looking back, I should have blocked the number, but as I mentioned, I just got blindsided by a breakup and wasn't thinking very well. Then, they kept calling. They would call, and if I didn't answer, they left messages saying how pretty I looked with my blue sweater that day, or how they knew how I took my coffee now and said they would remember it for when we finally meet and go out for a drink together. I blocked the numbers. They could call from another. I answered one day, yelling at them to leave me alone and hung up again. When they called back, it wasn't the boy, but his mother. She was very upset. She said I was hurting her boy by not wanting to play. And you could very clearly hear the boy crying and screaming in the background. At this point, it dawned on me 
that this wasn't a joke, prank, or something else. There was something seriously wrong with these people, and they were obviously watching me. For a few weeks following my breakup, I had to live in my car the entire time. I hardly slept. I was terrified thinking I would wake up one day and see him standing outside of the windows. When I finally got a place, he called to congratulate me and he couldn't wait to come and play. I haven't heard from the people for over a year now, but I checked my phone after a very busy workday and noticed 10 missed calls and I'm terrified to check my voicemail. I've reached out to cops, but they won't do anything since I haven't been explicitly threatened and have been advised to just block the calls. I'm going to change my number, but I'm afraid that the numbers will continue even after that and that it will upset them further. I posted this so you all could read it, and people have been kind to reach out with advice and tips, but I still feel like I'm living a horror movie. If you have any more advice or tips to give me, I would highly appreciate it. This incident took place in the summer of 2023. Last year, I transferred with my company to take on a new position in a new major, Midwestern city. My spouse was still working and living back in California for the next few months. So I rented a studio apartment for myself in a newly renovated apartment, being in a popular downtown neighborhood until we could look for a place together. The apartment was small, but nice. It was in a secure building with interior hallways and a nice downstairs lobby. I was one of the first tenants to move into this newly renovated building and the other new residents soon started moving in afterwards. A major advantage of this move was that I'd only be a couple of hours drive from my hometown and my parents. I started my new job and everything was going great. I was enjoying my new neighborhood and the neighbors in the apartment building generally kept to themselves like I did. Then a new guy moved in across the hall and something changed. We'll call him David. David was a single man in the 60s and was very different from the college students and young professionals who lived in our building. I started noticing his erratic behavior almost immediately. I would come home from work and he would be sitting in his car in our small parking lot just starting off in the distance. We were having issues that summer with smoke clouds coming over the Bass Canadian wildfires. They were leaving a light dusting of ash on our cars, similar to pollen. David was convinced that someone was spraying this dust on his car and was accusing various tenants he'd run into in the parking lot. He would hoard trash into his apartment and leave trash bags in the hallway causing a foul older. He would also be yelling at himself in the hallway. I finally had had enough and complained to the leasing office. The manager was quick to dismiss my concerns, saying that she'd been in his apartment and everything was fine. In August, my parents' 50th anniversary was coming up, and I was excited to go home and spend a weekend with them. A few days before their anniversary, my boss informed me that he would be flying into work on an important project with me that would have us working through the weekend. I was really disappointed and felt like I was letting my parents down, but I managed to get away for a quick overnight trip in the middle of the week to see them and get back before my boss was due to arrive. I drove down and spent the night with them. 
The next morning, I checked my email as I was getting ready to head back. There was an email from my apartment manager in regard to the incident the night before. The email was very vague, but it stated that a resident was dead and there would be further details coming later. My heart sank and I immediately went pale. My mind instinctively went to my strange neighbor, David. I opened up a local news app from my city, and the top story was about an active shooter in my apartment building who was killed during a SWAT team standoff the night before. Apparently, David approached the next-door neighbor in the hallway with a gun and threatened to shoot him. The neighbor ran into his apartment and called 911. David also called 911 and told the dispatcher that his neighbors were hacking his phone and if the police didn't come, he was going to start shooting people. The police came and tried to talk to David, but he had barricaded himself into his apartment and claimed to be heavily armed. The state police and the SWAT team soon arrived and David began firing a rifle out of his window at anyone he saw in the parking lot below. All the neighbors on the floor were trapped in their apartments with no way of escape. They had to get down and barricade themselves from the gunfire. There was another building across the street with a direct line of sight into our apartment building. A police sniper took a position in the building across the street and shot David through the window. Then they flew a drone into his open window and confirmed that he was in fact dead with a gun still in his hand. Luckily, no one else was injured. I got home later that night to a bullet-ridden apartment building and several neighbors who normally didn't speak to each other were hugging and trying and crying and showing each other videos of the incident from their hiding places. I've never been so lucky to have been out of town. If my boss hadn't messed up my plans, I would have been home that night. I'm sorry David didn't get the mental health attention he needed, but he put so many lives in danger. I hope I never get to meet another David again in my life. When I was about 25 or so, my boyfriend and I decided to live apart. We were broken up for a very short while, and when we got back together, we just kept separate places for a long, long time. I highly recommend all women live on their own for at least a year before they decide to cohabitate. I learned a lot of life lessons during this time. My apartment was pretty amazing for a young single woman who was supporting herself. Although it was a one bedroom, it boasted a separate office and dining room as well. Each room was a separate room with its own door. However, the layout was a little strange, except for the bathroom. The rooms didn't branch off a hallway or anything. Instead, you went through each room separately to get through the place, and my bathroom was at the end. When you entered the apartment, the rooms went as follows. Living room to the office. Then you either turned right to a small hallway that led to the bedroom, bathroom branched off here, or you went straight ahead and into the kitchen, then turned right to go to the dining room and the bedroom. The best feature of my apartment was accessibility from the kitchen. The back door opened up onto a large covered balcony. The place was large and cheap, $450 a month in the year of 2000, and all utilities paid. I even got free basic cable. The landlords were a rare find. They were elderly and very sweet. 
and quickly took care of issues that came up. Except for one exception. My back door. The one leading to the balcony. It had no lock on it. Now, it's actually mostly my fault that I didn't make it a priority to get fixed. I really thought that I was pretty safe because the balcony has no steps leading down or anything, and the wall was sheer. The balcony was high up enough that a standard ladder would not reach it. So if someone tried to enter, they would have to be extremely determined. Now, my decorating tastes are a little boho, and I'm very fond of stuff that sparkles and shines. My apartment reflected my tastes and was decorated with fairies and crystals and butterflies. I had sun catchers and wind chimes in the appropriate locations. My friend gave me a couple of sets of miniature fairy chimes as a gift, and as they were very small, I decided to hang them on each of my doors. I enjoyed the slight tinkling sound they made whenever the doors opened and closed. Thank God, or whatever you worship, for my eclectic tastes. I'm sitting in the office playing some flash time waster of a game on my computer when I hear the chimes on my balcony door. I assumed I had failed to shut it completely and the wind had blown it open. So I jump up to close it again. And I come face to face with a skinny, shirtless, sweaty ginger dude with gel house tats all over his chest. He's obviously surprised to see me. I'm scared shitless, but I try not to show it. You hear all these stories of people being severely beaten or even killed when interrupting a robbery. I'm surprised that he didn't just knock me over the head with something and run back. But luckily, he didn't. What the fuck are you doing? The guy kind of laughs and says, <laughs> Oh, mm -mm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm here doing some contracting work on your apartment. How did you get in? Is some dude here? Who? I worked for some dude and he told me I'd have to climb the porch. He said the back door would be unlocked. I look and there's no ladder, rope, or anything to climb on. I'm thinking, who is this dude? Batman? I have no idea who some dude is, and no, there's no work scheduled for this apartment. Also, in case you haven't noticed this, I gestured toward the balcony, nearly screaming now, is not a fucking porch. As Ginger Dude is mumbling again about how he was hired by some dude to do the work and something about climbing the porch, I realize that he is not so steady on his feet. He is also slurring his words a bit. Great. The guy is under the influence of something and through his stupid senseless mumbling, I finally just resort to screaming, Get out! Get out! Over and over. He says he feels really bad about scaring me. And before I realize what is happening, he grips me in a smelly, sweaty hug. He goes out the door, and the second he is gone, I have a full-blown panic attack. I'm bent over, head between my knees, wondering faintly if I should call the cops or someone when I hear a traffic crash from my living room area. As it turns out, Ginger Dude had gone into another apartment of my building and climbed into the attic area. As he was poking around, he lost his footing. There are beams you have to step onto across the attic and had fallen through the ceiling. I stand in my living room and I'm looking at a pair of scrawny legs poking through the suspended ceiling. 
He pulls himself up and in a high-pitched, smart-ass kind of voice, calls out, Excuse me! This infuriates me, and being the smart, modern woman I am, going strong into the attic to confront him. He once again starts giving me his bullshit story about being hired to do work on the place, and I tell him he's full of shit. He holds his hands up and in an appeasing manner and says, Okay, okay, what do you want for me? I tell him, What I want for you to do is go downstairs, and I want you to sit on the curb, and I want you to wait for the police, because I'm calling them right now. They are coming, and they're taking your ass to jail. When the police showed up, he was sitting obediently on the curb, patiently awaiting his ride to the pokey. Turned out his girlfriend at the time was in the apartment next to me, and he thought he was breaking into her place. My landlord's got a new lock on that door in short order. <laughs> Just wait, folks. There's more. Eventually, I got called to testify in court against him, along with a number of other people whose homes he apparently also invaded. I get approached by a Brittany in a teensy denim skirt, and this is the conversation. Brit, are you the girl whose apartment Ginger Boy broke into? Me. Yes, I am. I'm his ex. Oh. No, 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 not your neighbor. I'm his baby mama. Yes, she really did say that. Are you going to press charges? Uh, yes, I am. Well, I don't blame you, but I just wanted to let you know that he has a two-year-old and a baby on the way. So you might want to think about that. Uh, why? He didn't think about that before he did what he did. He has kids to support. I just, I just think you should think about it, that's all. Look, I appreciate your situation, but... My situation? I got no situation. He never gave me nothing. He hasn't even seen his child in months. Yada, yada, yada. Hmm. Maybe you should think about that. As for me, I'll be pressing charges. Turns out, Ginger Boy had broken into multiple houses and actually attacked an elderly woman who happened to be home when he broke in. He got five years for breaking into my place. Not sure what he got for the others. Maybe it was five years total, well, I really forgot. The courthouse took a couple of hours, but I got a paid day off from the work because I was subpoenaed. I had no idea why he didn't attack me like he did to the elderly lady. I feel extremely lucky because usually stories like this don't end so well. It did, however, give me one hell of a story to tell. So to the crazy man breaking into the apartment, I hope you are enjoying those bars for a very, very long time. To give context, I used to be a 911 dispatcher for a small city. We dispatched all law, fire, and EMS for the entire county. And within this county were multiple law agencies. I had been there for about three months or so when I met him. Let's call him Jake. Jake had recently transferred from a big department in California and landed himself randomly at our department. It didn't make much sense as to why he left California in the first place, but he always insisted it was just time for him to move on to a smaller, less dangerous place. Him and I quickly became close and would chat almost every day after I got off a shift. Within a few moments, it became apparent 
that we liked each other and our flirting progressed into something more serious. Fast forward a few months later, and it turned out he was doing some inappropriate things to photos and videos of me whilst he was actively on duty. This and a few other things he had kept hidden on duty led to him losing his license and leaving. During the process of his termination, his sergeant had suggested I get a protective order against him as he had made threatening statements previously toward me, such as, you better be telling the truth. I'll find out on Tuesday if you're coming to lie to me, etc. I had began to fill out the paperwork and was told I had a temporary protective order on him in the meantime, but don't think I ever did. After two weeks after his termination, he calls me to catch up. The entire call is like an old friend to an old friend. What am I doing for work? Do I have a boyfriend now? But progressively turns more personal. When does my shift end? What do you drive? Being 18 and naive, I treated him like I always had, answering his questions. I had contacted his old department afterwards, as his sergeant had told me to let him know if I was ever contacted again. But they turned me away pretty quickly and didn't want anything to do with it. With that, I blocked Jake. Roughly a month later, I get a call from a new number, and it's Jake. Once again, he wants to meet up and catch up, but this time he was so casually and goes on to tell me about his new house he's wanting to buy in the neighborhood. During this call, he progressively got more aggressive as well, making statements such as, if I knew I was going to get canned, I should have just had my way with you. He half-heartedly joked about getting a hotel room just for me, and that was that. A few days later, he FaceTimed me, and once again came off as simply wanting to catch up, as he was sick. Midway through our seemingly normal conversation, he makes it apparent he's been touching himself this entire time. Keep in mind, nothing suggestive was mentioned, and our conversation at that point was about a new dog. He's blocked once again, but has never tried to follow my social media, and now I've started to see him in my area. Last I knew, he nearly lived 30 to 45 miles in the opposite direction from me. Am I reading into this, or should I genuinely consider the stalking? And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout-out to the reformed members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.